Marcus Aurelius, the Stoic Emperor. Marcus Aurelius Antoninus Augustus was born on April 26th, 121 CE in Rome. Marcus was born into a wealthy family and he was given the name of his father and grandfather, which was Marcus Annius Verus. So just know Marcus Aurelius's name changed probably four or five times over the, over the course of his life. During this time in Rome, People would change their name based on family or status. It changed so much, it's actually so hard to keep up with. So we're going to stick with mainly Marcus Aurelius. Now, Marcus's family became very wealthy because of the olive oil trade, and they were part of this group called the Ani. Now, this group originated in Spain and was so powerful that they actually frequently met with the emperor. Marcus was born during the time of Pax Romana, which lasted from 27 BCE to 180 CE. And this is during a time of Roman peace. Pax Romana means Roman peace. Rome stretched from England in the north to Morocco in the south to Iraq in the east. So Rome was massive and it's surprisingly how peaceful it was especially during this time. Marcus's father was basically trying to climb the ranks in the Ani group, but he died in 124 CE. And one of the ranks he was trying to get to, you would have had to been at least like 32 years old. So he died very, very young. But Marcus's mother was Domitia Calvia, and she came from a very wealthy family as well. So they were very well off, very comfortable. They had many servants. Everything was good. Life was good. And at the age of seven, Marcus Aurelius started learning reading, writing, and arithmetic, as well as drama and other subjects. And he was admitted to the priestly college of Salii. Marcus actually became very close with the then emperor Hadrian, and Hadrian nicknamed Marcus as the truest because of his love for reason and education. And it was said that Marcus's tutor, Dionysus, actually introduced him to philosophy. Now, by the age of 12, Marcus loved philosophy so much that he actually wore this very tough Greek robe all the time, and he would always sleep on the floor, which actually reminds me of Socrates, how he would only wear this very tough robe, and basically all he cared about was being a philosopher. He didn't care about where he slept, what he slept on, what he wore, anything like that. And Marcus continued sleep on, sleeping on the floor until his mother just said, no, you can't, you can't do that anymore. Then at the age of 14, Marcus got to wear the togus virilis, which was a mark of manhood, meaning that he was now actually a member of society and he was part of the empire. Now jumping way ahead to 136 CE, Emperor Hadrian nearly died of a stroke, and so he had to decide who was actually going to become the next emperor. So he found this man, Sionius, and he was planning on having Sionius become the new emperor. But on January 1st of 138 CE, Sionius died. So Hadrian designated Antoninus Pius, who was Marcus Aurelius's uncle, as the new emperor. However, Antoninus Pius had to adopt Marcus Aurelius, as well as Sionius's son, to potentially become the new leaders, the new rulers in the future. And around the same time, Marcus was introduced to a woman named Faustina, who he was going to marry, but they couldn't actually get married until 145 CE because of her age. And over the course of their lives, they had around 13 children together, and a few of those would die from various different circumstances, which was pretty common at the time to have a lot of children die, but I believe they still had 11 living children. Now, all throughout this time, Marcus was still very focused on education and philosophy. Actually, when he realized that he could potentially become emperor in the future, and he was adopted by his uncle, Antoninus Pius, he was said to have basically been thrown a fit and been upset that he had now become part of the royal family, basically, because he wanted to live the life of a philosopher. And Antoninus Pius ruled for a pretty good amount of time until he died in 161 CE, and now Marcus Aurelius and Lucius then had to take the throne and rule Rome. Now, Marcus was known as the last of the five good emperors. 
And the previous four were Nerva, who reigned from 96 to 98 CE, Trahan, which ruled from 98 to 117, Hadrian, which ruled from 117 to 138, and then it was obviously Antoninus Pius, who ruled from 138 to 161. Now, Marcus was Caesar. He was the ruler of Rome. And even though Lucius had a lot of power, Marcus still wanted him to have a lot more power than he did have, but he just, he just couldn't have more power. And it was said that Lucius was actually not very good at taking care of responsibilities and basically just carrying his own weight as a ruler. But it seemed like Marcus constantly tried to be the best he could be and lift other people up as well, especially now that he was in this position of power that he didn't really want to be in. So while this man is trying to live the life of a philosopher, in 162 CE, he has to deal with these terrible floods from the Tiber River, which caused famine. It was absolutely terrible. So many, so many people died. Now he had to deal with the responsibilities of taking care of the people of Rome after this massive famine. So he offered free public burials to anyone who wanted it. And obviously, a lot of people took it. Now, during this time, so many people died that Rome actually was not receiving a good amount of funding, which means a lot of people must have died. Now, this is one weird part, and even though they're technically not brothers, they are adopted brothers, and we're still with each other for a good amount of time. So, Lucius actually married Marcus's sister in 164 CE, which would be a little weird, like your brother's. Not technically, but still. Then in 165 CE, the Roman-Parthian War ended. This war was caused by Roman imperialism and a clash between Roman rulers and Middle Eastern rulers. Frankly, if I got into this, this video would be an hour long and more like a history lecture. So if you want to check that out, I'll leave a link in the description to the Roman-Parthian War and everything about that so you guys can go look at it yourselves. And at this time, it was very clear that Rome was just starting to get too big. They were constantly trying to expand, and already it was the Roman Empire was massive. So many bad things were happening across the empire, even during this time of peace, that the empire was just stretched too thin sometimes. So now, the Romans had to deal with the Macromanni War, which was actually about a German tribe rebelling against the Roman Empire and attacking them. The Macromanni, under the leadership of King Balomar, initially achieved some success in their rebellion. They were able to defeat the several Roman armies and even invaded Italy. However, the Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius, with the help of his able general, Aulus Cornelius Palma, was eventually able to turn the tide of the war. The Romans adopted a defensive strategy, building forts and defensive walls, and slowly pushed back the Macromanni. The Macromanic Wars had a significant impact on the Roman Empire, as it drained its resources and weakened its military. And this marked the beginning of the end of the Pax Romana. Now, I don't know about you, but my favorite movie ever is Gladiator. So it's cool now to know that when I watch the beginning of that movie again, it's not, oh, that's just the German barbarians. That's, that was, oh, that was from the Macromanic Wars. So I just think that's cool to learn about. Then in 169 CE, Lucius actually died from food poisoning. Although a lot of historians believe that it could have been from smallpox because this was spreading quite rapidly at the time. And this means that Marcus Aurelius became the sole ruler of Rome. Now, Rome was not done with the German barbarians yet because there was a new tribe called the Quadi who had also joined the rebellion, and now in 173 CE, Marcus Aurelius had to deal with them. And there was this famous incident called the Miracle of Rain, which was depicted on a column of Marcus Aurelius, as well as on coins. So here's a good quote I found about the Miracle of Rain from another website. For when the Romans were in peril, in the course of the battle, the, the divine power saved them in a most unexpected manner. The Quadi had surrounded them at a spot favorable for their purpose, and the Romans were fighting valiant, valiantly with their shields locked together. Then the barbarians ceased fighting, expecting to capture them easily as the result of the heat and their thirst. So they posted guards all about and hemmed them in to prevent them getting water anywhere, for the barbarians were far superior in numbers. The Romans, accordingly, were in a terrible plight from fatigue, wounds, heat from the sun, and thirst, and so could neither fight nor retreat. 
but were standing the line and at their several posts scorched by the heat, when suddenly many clouds gathered and a mighty rain, not without divine interposition, burst upon them. Indeed, there is a story to the effect that Harnufius, an Egyptian magician, that's interesting to say, Egyptian magician, who was companion of Marcus, had invoked by means of enchantments various deities, and in particular Mercury, the god of air, and by this means attracted the rain. So that was where the whole miracle of rain thing came from. Which honestly, if you were the Romans in that position, it would definitely feel like a miracle. Now during this time from 171 to 175, this is when it was said Marcus was writing his meditations. And it's not like he was trying to write this book for other people to see. It wasn't, it wasn't even a book, it was more of a journal. It was him writing to himself. It was his reflections. It was him telling himself the importance of reason, of self-control, and of living a virtuous life. It was about him writing how you can find happiness in accepting your fate. Really what made him a great man, which I'm going to talk about more at the end of the video, a lot of it was not about all the other things that were happening in the Roman Empire. It was about what he was doing personally, his reflections. Anyway, in late April in 175 CE, Avidius Cassius actually thought that Marcus Aurelius had died because Marcus's wife, Faustina, had spread this rumor that Marcus might have died. But this was because she wanted to secure Commodus, her son, in the position of emperor in the future. And because of this, Cassius thought, well, now I'm going to rebel. And he gained support from many provinces in Egypt, Syria, and Arabia. And he was going to rebel against the Roman Empire. So when Marcus then went in to invade Cassius with overwhelming support and force, one of Cassius's own centurions actually killed him, cut off his head, and sent his head to Marcus to say, here's proof, he's dead. Which is probably the way to do that. I mean, if you can't send a picture on your phone, just mail him the guy's head. And around the same time, Faustina actually died in Turkey, and people aren't exactly sure how she died. She could have died of natural causes, suicide, or even assassination, but nobody knows. In 177 CE, Commodus was made co-emperor with Marcus Aurelius, and later, Commodus would actually be assassinated when he would become emperor. And he was assassinated by a wrestler in a bath. The wrestler just held his head underwater until he died. But then in 180 CE, Marcus Aurelius dies. Now, what makes him a great man? Well, as I said before, it wasn't the events that happened within Rome. He definitely made many mistakes in dealing with the many problems of Rome, even during this time of Pax Romana, this time of peace. He made many mistakes. But what made him a great man was his reflections. Now, I think a lot of people get self-reflection wrong. It's not just about looking at yourself in the past. It's about looking at yourself in the present moment and being as conscious of your sub subconscious as you possibly can. And I think that's something that Stoicism gets absolutely correct. It's about being present, focused on the moment, but also reflecting on what you can be doing better within this present moment instead of looking back on the past all the time. So I think Marcus Aurelius's reflections on himself, his attention on himself, not in a bad way, but how he could be a better person was what made him a great man, especially how he did this basically throughout his entire life, always trying to be a better man. There's this one clip from Gladiator that I'm thinking of when Marcus Aurelius dies where he's talking to Maximus and he goes, how will people remember me? I mean, don't all old men want to know how people rem will remember them? And he says something like, will people remember me as the tyrant, the philosopher? And he says a few more things that I don't remember, but I definitely think that that's what he might have been thinking at the time. I think he probably understood that he made a lot of mistakes and he's wondering how people will look back on him but anyway guys if you'd like to like i said you can check out some of the links in the description to the macromani war as well as the roman parthian war it's it's a lot to go through and like i said this video would be an hour long if i went through all of that but this is why marcus Aurelius was a great man his self-reflection his attention on himself 
not in a narcissistic way, but in a way of how can I be better in this present moment? So I hope you guys have a great day and I'll see you guys next time.